Let's do a Harmony flat top. It's been a while. We got the big boy today. It's the H1260, which is akin to a dreadnought, but bigger. This thing is more than 16 inches. I think it's like 16 and a quarter inches across the lower bout. So it just barely fits into a standard dreadnought case with some squeezing and pushing. The Harmony Sovereign was pretty much the top of the line for the company. Introduced in 1958 as kind of the poor man's D-18, I'd say. It's got mahogany back and sides, Sitka spruce top, Brazilian rosewood board and bridge, and ladder bracing. Ladder bracing refers to the internal system of struts, which cross the soundboard at regular intervals, um, like rungs on a ladder. They're parallel to each other, basically. Versus the Martin guitar system, the X-Brace, and their emulators, uh, which has two braces which cross sort of in the middle of the soundboard. They're interlocking like this. These days it's quite trendy to convert these things by popping the backs off and changing them over into an X-Brace pattern. Uh, I've got nothing against people who do that. Why is it done? Um, ladder braced guitars have kind of a different tonal envelope. They usually favor the higher frequencies and the sound um, might be best described as it's not quite as complex or colorful as an x braced instrument. Sometimes the bass response is a little bit lacking, but that doesn't mean that they sound bad. It's just a different sound. And sometimes you need that sound. Jimmy Page used one of these to record the intro to Stairway to Heaven, for instance. A Sovereign was his main acoustic for a long time. They got a lot of things going for them. One thing I would say about them is that they're maybe not the easiest guitars to amplify in a live situation. Uh, they tend to record pretty well, but getting them on stage, a sound hole pickup is probably the way to go, like an LR Bags or an old D. Armand sound hole pickup. Um, soundboard transducers are kind of hard to make work, as there's this big thick brace right under the bridge, and you can't get something like K and K pickups close enough to the place you want them to be and have them function. And under saddle pickups tend to sort of exacerbate the slightly more strident nasal quality you naturally have in these guitars. This is probably from towards the end of the run, I think. They were made up until 1971, I believe. I'll see if I can find a date in here. Sometimes it's stamped under the top, sometimes it's on the back. What's it need? The usual. It actually sounds surprisingly good for a guitar with absolutely no saddle on it. The strings are actually resting on the wood. This has been carved down flush with the top of the bridge. Uh, it might be difficult for me to get this out, actually. We'll see. But anyway, the action is high. It's 10 64ths on the bass side, 9 on the treble. That's 3.9 millimeters to about 3.5. Uh, 156 thousandths to 140 thousandths. That's um, 1.3 Japanese bu, which is 12.8 rin if we're using the old system. Yeah, I know, we're all looking at the top right now. Some funny things have happened. This has been abraded with something like scotch Bright pad or something, taking it down to a kind of satin finish, possibly to remediate um, a time when some other kind of finish was sprayed over the lacquer, which maybe didn't go so well, because you can see this ghosting here around the sound hole, and there is a kind of skim milk appearance to some spray that's on the inside opposite the hole in the back there. Um, it's missing the pick guard. The heel cap on the other side is broken in sort of a funny way. And there's some separation at the heel. So, you know, there's an aftermarket nut which has been sort of propped on there. So like I say, it needs the usual. Some of my repair compatriots refuse to work on these. To be honest, I don't mind as long as they're not seriously abused, because they're made of good materials and they're repairable. They're put together with hide glue, the necks usually come off, and, you know, if I'm going to do a neck reset on one of these, I charge the same as I would on a Martin. If someone's willing to pay that, fine. I want to check the neck relief. There might be a bit excess there. Yeah, it's around, around 11, 12 thousandths, which isn't bad. These tuners have been switched out at some point to a Cluson style tuner. 
actually pings. But uh, they seem to function well. And this has all of the grommet style tuner bushings, which is great because these often fall out over the years and get lost. So to have a full complement of them, excellent. Hey, want to see what happens when I take the string tension off? Because that can often change quite a bit with a ladder brace guitar. Right now, the plane of the frets projects to one eighth of an inch above the top of the soundboard. So with all the string tension off, we have gains more than a 32nd of an inch, which means that under string tension, the bridge rocks forward. And this is what's very prone to happen in a ladder braced guitar, um, sinking the top in this area here. And um, basically, it, it's important to know that when we're setting the neck angle and projecting the top surface of the frets, because uh, if we do it too high above the top surface here, and that dipping happens, we could end up with a saddle which needs to be much too tall uh, for practical purposes. Um, because it's going to dip down, right? Gaining height on, on the top of the saddle. So, yeah, I don't want to overset this neck. Why the top loading bridge design? Who knows? Could just be cost cutting measure. You know, save yourself six cents on a set of bridge pins. If you're going to make a hundred thousand guitars a year, that's six thousand dollars. That's like half a working man's salary. It also helps to look at the truss rod before we begin, just to make sure it's not broken off in there. The nut in these is that really small quarter inch one. I'm loosening the nut. This thing I don't think has ever been touched from the time it went in. I'm loosen it off a bit. Put a little oil in there. you got to be careful with these rods because they're quite slender. They're usually an over-under design and um, they're like they're chased with I think 832 threads so there's not a whole lot there and you don't want to over tighten them. Okay, the irons from a company called Hangar 9. I don't believe it's available anymore. Do a search for sealing iron as in sealing a package you should find something. I'm drilling some small diameter holes through the 15th fret slot, which should meet a void in front of the dovetail. Okay, like I always say, these are foam cutters from Hot Wire Foam Factory in California. They're the 4-inch model. I run it through the Crafters Power Supply, which is simply a DC wall wart. I don't use a variable supply. It's not necessary for these guys. You could try and use one of the El Cheapo versions from Amazon. In that case, you would want some kind of um, a rheostat or a uh, DC um, power supply that you can control because oftentimes the ones in China seem to run a lot hotter and you'll end up with big scorch marks and burning. Um, these things I just plug them into the wall and they seem to be the right temperature to do the job without having to mess with their temperature. You see in this case this neck is loose enough to begin with that I'm not even bothering putting it into the, um, the neck press. I'm just gonna let this heat up and it'll come free on its own. There's a bunch of nasty old hide glue and a shim in there. Let's have a look at the dovetail here. I think it's good for illustrative purposes to kind of show the pressure or maybe even desperation they were under at the assembly bench there, slapping those necks on. See, we've got the partial shim up at the top end of the dovetail. And there's a dry spot in the center and then a good dollop of glue down at the very end where it's run. Um, and, you know, anytime you see a shim on the top side, things are kind of out of control. Because you really want most of the focus and pressure to be on the far side of the, the dovetail here. So that's where most of the force is 
um, really centered and if there's any looseness down here that's what allows the neck to start pulling up and away from the pocket. So you end up with that slight gap or hairline appearing at this end of the heel and you know you're, you're sort of on the way to a rising action. There is no shim on the other side. Okay, I'm just going to clean up the front surface here, the contacts, the sides, and I'm going to slightly undercut it towards the center a little bit. And I really focus most of my attention on the end of the heel here where much more material is coming off. I basically don't have to undercut it all up here. It's probably detrimental to do so because you don't want a whole great big void all the way along if you can avoid it. You want, I think, good contact between both the front surface of the heel and the sides it's resting against. So, sharp chisel. And now for another harmony of slightly different character. This is an early 60's two pickup rocket hollow body arch top. The issue on this one is a pickup which is no longer picking up. Can't pick up the good vibrations and therefore it's leaving us lacking in excitations. Lots of volume on the neck. Nothing coming out of the bridge. I've previously looked under the hood and ascertained that it really is the pickup that is bad and not something else in the wiring. Uh, there is a short somewhere within its coil. As I mentioned recently when working on that Burns base, a lot of older pickups now, say I go 60 years plus, this is including a lot of old Fender guitars that I've noticed recently, the insulating varnish that's placed on the coil wire is starting to break down. You know how we get checking in old lacquer finishes? The same thing can happen in the coil. And um, with that we end up getting little shorts. Sometimes big shorts. Sometimes of course there are physical breaks in the wire too. Or there can be solder connections or solder connections for the leads that can degrade a bit and go cold with time. But sometimes it just goes dead, you know. I mentioned that rewiring is possible. And I may actually get into doing a little bit of that myself because I've ordered the parts to make a Super El Cheapo pickup winder, which I'm sure you'll see at some point. But for this, I contacted a local pickup maker, Paul Alfano, who makes pickups under the name Pickup Pickups, which is great. And I can't believe that was still free, but he's got that. Um, so he's got a slick CNC operated rig for doing rewinds, and I got him to take a little footage of the process for us. With the pickup mounted on the winder, he does the first few turns by hand. This is extremely thin wire. It's about two thousandths of an inch thick, which is about 0 0.06 millimeters. It's like hair, basically. Oh, difficult to see sometimes, actually. And then once that's going, he can use this CNC-controlled winding head, which scatter winds, um, causes a variable... Uh, random pattern to the wire, which some people contend gives you a better sound, a more rich and interesting sound. So hand-wired pickups are kind of prized for that. This one simulates it. By the time he's got the coil filled up, he's got thousands of winds of wire on there. Ended up being about 8.5k ohms, which is a nice hot bridge pickup resistance reading. He'll solder the connection leads on, We'll put the cover back in place and it'll be ready to install. When I had previously redone the wiring harness, I left a lead that was accessible through the F-hole so I wouldn't have to take the whole thing out again. Okay, moment of truth. Sound! Hooray! This is a high strength contact adhesive. If I was using celluloid, which is actually quite difficult for me to get in Canada in sizes for this purpose, uh, I would be using a different kind of adhesive, but this is an ABS style plastic. So a generous coat will let that dry and I'll clamp it together. 
One of the reasons I favor these Scandinavian style carving knives is they have really wide flat bevels which allows me to register against the curved surface there of the heel and carry it over and transfer it. I'll follow that up with some file and sandpaper work. The knot has been glued on with a substantial amount of something like epoxy. Okay, remnants of original wood and shim and goo. Looks like I'm going to be routing a deeper saddle slot. The front edge of the bridge has been planed down slightly uh, and the remnants of the saddle have been glued in place and they're only about like a millimeter and a half thick so we need more than that. Because the bridge has been planed down and we've got these tapered uh, side wings here, I think it makes sense to change this into a blind slot rather than the through slot that it's got now. Because uh, if I go very much deeper, well every pass is basically going to extend it out into that tapered section of the wings. And before you know it, you've got a saddle that's like four inches long, which looks weird and um, is not structurally all that great. So yeah, we want to keep it, in this case it'll be about three and three-eighths of an inch long, which is fine. It can also be difficult to find saddle blanks that are that long too, you know. I'm going to try and derive the shape of the previous pick guard by using tape on the surface and then rubbing with pencil. I used a compass cutter to make a template for the outer diameter of the sound hole ring. Then I'll use a flexible drawing form to fair up the curves. Back to the body. I'll be pulling strips of sandpaper through the joint to increase the angle of the neck relative to the body. Let's be aware of just how far offset the dovetail is on this neck. Much closer to this side than that. Whatever this ghosty white stuff is on here seems to be coming off with methyl hydrate. kind of cool. I'm going to cut the saddle slot deeper now. As I mentioned before, this is only about a millimeter and a half deep at present. I think I'm going to make it about four millimeters deep. I'll set the depth of my router bit in the center of the bridge. It tends to be like the highest. Placing the router on top of the height shim and lowering the bit so that it just touches the top surface of the bridge. I can get rid of the shim and rotating the bit so that it's in parallel with the center line. loosen my fence and then there's a process of going backwards and forwards so the bit is going to follow the previously routed channel. And I'm going to plunge in at the very ends to establish the depth there and then carry on in a series of uh, light passes back and forth with the uh, base plate of the router tipped slightly until it's running completely on the flat surface of the platform. I have thickened the dovetail using some strips of veneer glued on either side and with this small sanding beam I'll be able to perfect its fit in the pocket. We'll age the heel cap a little bit with a spray of tinted lacquer. For some reason there's a huge diversity in pick guard shapes for the Sovereign over the years. It's like they were making a new template every other year without regard to trying to make them identical with the previous ones. So the one I have in my collection is close but not exactly the same shape. I'll route it out. That's going to cover a lot of the finish damage but not all of it so there's some touch up to do. I'll wipe on a couple of coats of orange shellac which will darken the color. Later I'll come back and scuff sand that back down so it'll match the sheen on the rest of the instrument.
I'll scrape a bevel onto the edge of the pick guard before gluing it in place. Say the line, Bart. Say the line. Polishing, polishing, polishing. Right, we have established sovereignty. I think it's ready to go. Pretty happy with the way it turned out. Sounds good, fun to play. Good for another 30 years. <laughs>